Sean Armstrong, the guy in the picture, looks like the guy on the screen. Um, Sean is, I tell you, if he didn't exist, we'd have to invent him. Um, he's the uh, managing principal of Redwood Energy. Um, and he has been a guiding light for a number of years in terms of uh, electrification and products. I mean, if there's an obscure Italian uh, condensing unit or something, you know, uh, out there, he knows about it and has talked, you know, the, He's on a first name basis with the distributors and and uh, a lot there is um, I did make, uh, by the way, Sean, I did make a uh, in, in our lobby. I did make a uh, uh, a booth for Redwood Energy and uh, tried to put in a bunch of the um, guides that you've done. And uh, I'm sure you'll you know be talking about uh, your latest and uh, uh, but also even the uh, residential guides, which are, um, I mean, they're on, you know, there's the farmer's almanac, you know, so just we'll, we'll, we'll paint you, we'll compare you to Ben Franklin as uh, um, uh, someone bringing that information. So uh, don't worry about take it. Take it away, Sean. Battery. It's very kind of you. <laughs> I'm just a farm boy from rural Wisconsin, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you, Dennis. So Home Electrification and Beyond is what Dennis asked me to present on. And I'm going to interrupt the overly polite uh, introduction because I'm getting nervous about that. I'll just say like, hey, I, um, I started in 1995 studying how to get renewable energy into homes. There's a college program up at Humboldt State University, now Cal Poly Humboldt. In 2005, a decade later, I got my first job working for a development company. And in 2007, I actually got to start one as the project manager, but I did all the work, right? In 2011, I worked for a city of Arcata. And then since 2011, I've been a consultant. And as Dennis mentioned, we've written a whole bunch of books and papers and things because we were just focused on all electric, 100% solar powered construction. My partner is this very tall guy here, Michael Winkler, who's a city council member. And this is an all electric homeless housing facility. In the bottom here, just to demonstrate sort of the breadth of the work, this is a low income senior housing on the Washington DC Beltway that's under construction. It has a nine story tall vertical PV wall facing the Beltway on the, the parking garage to help make this 100% zero net energy. So I think it's fun to get located in history. Our government has been trying to help us electrify since 1934 when the Rural Electrification Administration was created. All these beautiful posters were trying to illustrate the power of electricity because only 10% of rural households had electricity in 1934. 90% of urban households did. And if we talk today about like the urban rural divide, it was crazy big back then. So everything from you know communication and lighting and running water, 1950s through the 70s, the, the private market stepped in as they started trying to get nuclear power plants for clean energy in our country, and we can argue about that being clean. I argue that it's not because we don't have a, a waste storage system. There's been spills, et cetera. Other people make great arguments how decarbonized it is, how reliant we are. Okay, said all those things. The important part of it is that the utilities, like 1900 of them, sponsored a number one television show, and then they advertised electrification during the intermissions. Ronald Reagan ran the show. He had retired and now he was uh, rehired and he became the quote unquote great communicator because he opened up every nuclear power plant by taking a train there and then speaking to people. So you can see the stars are on this television show, literally everyone that you've ever heard of other than Marilyn Monroe who Ronald Reagan discovered quote unquote, but she was never on the show, but everyone else from Groucho Marx to like Boris Koppel. So the next big thing that happens is to understand that in 2007, our country said, we're gonna to try to get to something like zero net energy in 2020 for federal buildings. And we're gonna subsidize efficiency and subsidize solar. This worked. At the time that this was signed, solar panels were in the range of five to $8 a watt. And they are today 15 cents a watt for the cheapest ones and 50 cents, 70 cents, but radical order of magnitude difference that really kicked in in 2011, right when my, my um, consulting started, thankfully. And then 
in 2016, the Propane Education Council is like, what is happening? What's happening here, we're losing market share everywhere in our country. And what you see here is a map they made of losing market share. They're dark blue. Light blue is natural gas and yellow is electrification. And since 1993, quietly, our country has been aggressively electrifying without anyone really talking about it. It's taken place mostly in the South. We have been accelerating it now since 2022. We've had massive deployment of battery and solar plants being started up in our country and the solar rebates and the energy efficiency rebates, even though they're not even out yet are already changing designs that I'm involved with. Lots of apartment complexes want to make themselves all electric to be ready for the incentives. And here is where we are today in all electric construction. You are in California, the worst state other than New York and Maine and Michigan. <laughs> And that's only by a little bit. This is why it's so weird for us. Our government had its own energy code starting in 1974 in response to the energy crisis. And all the way along, it's been steering us away from all electric construction on purpose until we had cheap solar and wind in the grid, until we had heat pumps that were working well in the wintertime. The assertion, which I'd say wasn't true, um, was that we should be going with gas. And in the South, you can see where there's cheap electricity and heat pumps always work because it didn't get to be very cold in the wintertime. You have up to 77% all electric construction in Florida. You know, but everywhere around us is better. Oregon, Nevada, Arizona. This is why it feels weird. If you were in some other more sophisticated state technologically, you know, Silicon Valley, it's always behind the trend. <laughs> and at least in this one, you are. But we're about to catch up. Here you can see the Bay Area Air Quality Management District on the left. They've started issuing 2027, 2029 deadlines for no more sale, no matter if something's broken or not. No more sale of gas furnaces and gas water heaters. And the California Air Resources, Air, Air Resources Board has phase out dates for the sale of everything by 2035 for a carbon neutral economy. We are behind. Don't think that we're ahead. I wish that we were. But California is behind most of the European nations who have been issuing bans on gas space heating and gas water heating for years now and have already done it. The stuff that we're saying we're going to do in 2030 and 2035, Ireland did it. <laughs> and Netherlands and Belgium and France and Austria. So don't get too high on your horse. We have to work. We have work to do. One of the wonderful people doing the work here is Rachel, Rachel Kukendall. She um, was a leader over at Sonoma Clean Power for a while, and now she's at pg e helping plan the replacement, the phase down of the entire gas infrastructure that pg e has. pg e wants to do this. They're trying to, it's the profitable move for the Wall Street owners. So you can take out your 30 inch wide gas stove and you can replace it with a $2,000 nice induction stove. That's one option. This is sort of like your premier good stove. You do this because the gas stove that you have here is one of the greatest dangers to your babies, to the senior citizens in your house and the pets. It's the number one producer of formaldehyde. It produces just as much air pollution as cigarette smoking. Think about that, secondhand cigarette smoke. Would you invite someone over to smoke in your living room every day, a pack or two? That's how much a gas stove produces with about 45 minutes of cooking on average every day, a couple packs of cigarettes. So terribly dangerous for kids, causes about one in eight uh, asthma cases in our United States, just the gas stove, solely that. Now, um, here are some cheaper and some more expensive options. If you don't wanna spend $2,000, get one for 550 bucks or $600. And these are electric resistance, but with a glass top, so they're easy to clean, they're safer, and say the coils, those are extra dangerous because if you touch them, the you know, same with like a gas flame. Those are, I don't like those, but a glass top electric resistant stove goes into almost every single affordable housing apartment that we've ever touched, 20,000 of them or something. And they're great. People don't complain about a glass top, it may not be as nice as what they want. But the induction, if you want to spend a little more money, is boils water twice as fast as a gas stove and will not endanger your health. Then on the bottom, if you got some money to throw at it, you can get for $3,500 up to, you know, $20,000. <laughs> if you want to get something that goes into a, a B&B, that goes into your historical retrofit aesthetic, you can get 
things that look like they're from 1954, but they were built this year from North Star as an example, you know, retro collections and such, really gorgeous candy colored, fancy knobs, all that kind of stuff. If you want to cook outside, uh, get a Weber. I would have probably told you that if you wanted a charcoal grill, get a Weber, everyone likes Webers. But these are um, what you have for apartments and in California where we're not allowed really to have barbecue fires and campfires and such in the summer because of fire risk and air pollution that's already too much. Um, putting the food out on a Weber grill is terrific. Essentially every boat has a, an electric grill. So no matter how rich you are, you're definitely gonna be grilling on electricity if you're out on your yacht. Now, being as where we are, Resiliency during frequent power outages during the fire season is what we have to work with for the rest of our lives. And one of the best strategies we've found is trucks and cars that have batteries in them. I have friends who've been doing this since the mid 90s, plugging in their chest freezers into their Nissan Leaf or whatever car they had back in the 1990s. Because um, these are friends from the 1990s who are telling me about it and they still do it. So you, if you have a power outage up here, you can people know that you can plug appliances into your electric vehicle. It might take a, like a little mini inverter for 60 bucks or whatever. But the F-150 Lightning, that has 10 Tesla power walls in it of battery. So most people put three on a house that's like a big house, they're trying to have power resiliency, maybe four. That's extravagant. And we're talking in the range of $70,000 to install four Tesla power walls. For $70,000, you can buy this, and it's got 10 Tesla power walls. So plugging 240 volt appliances into it, plugging the entire house into it, this is what the truck can do now. And so I, we just finished a study to show how big of a deal this is. So EV batteries can provide California with the most battery backup. So there is no rolling blackout for everybody that you have to have a battery personally respond to. Instead, let's use the batteries that are there now. So last summer, the residential batteries were being used in pg e territory, Tesla Powerwalls, LG Chem batteries. And they kept the lights on for us through like four different heat waves last summer. And I was like, yay, house batteries. Check out how many vehicle batteries are driving around California right now, June, 2023, all the way up here, 70 gigawatt hours versus like one <laughs> for vehicles and about 22 for the grid. So don't pay attention to numbers on the side. We don't have time for that. But basically what you can see here is that people use their cars 37 miles on average. So we took that out of the battery capacity. Then we said people want to have at least 80 miles left on their cars. Okay, that's all of that. We still have roughly twice as much battery. Even after all the possible things you'd want to do with your vehicle, drive it everywhere, have emergency reservoirs of energy, yada, yada. Still, that's the big battery in our grid to help us avoid power outages. And PG&E this summer is using the F-150 Lightning as their power backup, their grid backup, they're experimenting with it. Now you think, Sean, this is crazy. And I'm like, no, 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 this is just the trickle down. This has already been going on for years for the wealthy. This is a solar and battery yacht. This is a house like the house that you live in, but it's got six staterooms, six nice bedrooms, a big, dining floor, it's got an outdoor hot tub, an outdoor movie theater, comes with an airplane, comes with a submarine, right? Here's its submarine, comes off the side, comes with jet skis, pop out the side, these are electric jet skis. And this goes 100 miles a day across the Atlantic Ocean. You're like, well, what does that compare to something else though? Well, it's one third as fast. You go 300 miles a day across the ocean with a gas engine in this. And if you had a sail, you'd be going um, instead of 100 miles a day, what is that, it'd be about 30 miles a day. So this is about three times faster than sailing and about one third as fast as going on gas, but it's nice, very nice. And so they sell, this is the Silent 120 you're looking at, it's 120 feet long, but they sell Silent 60s, this is the one they started with years ago, Silent 80s you can get, then they went to Silent 100s and discontinued it, now they got Silent 120s. But this is um, solar and batteries. It's completely self-sufficient that way. Obviously you get food, you get water, but the energy part of it, self-sufficient. I love the submarine. These jet skis, crazy fast, 65 miles per hour, no noise, no oil spill behind you, no rainbow sheen. 
same platform that put it in snowmobiles 60 miles an hour in three seconds with no sound and you can get right up next to the caribou right up next to the bison without frightening them when you're going out in the winter time they don't hear you coming you make no noise uh like there's these tours up in the like the arctic north the northern light tours and they try to get close to the caribou with the gas ones and even the four stroke hondas and such are too noisy but the electric ones get them up next to caribou this is um, a fantastic fireplace that you should consider. So it makes an, ultras an ultrasound that you can't hear, cannot hear its ultrasound, right? Ultrasound, um, it vibrates water and it makes this mist that you're looking at, it's a theater effect, but they light it up with LEDs or with halogens and it looks just like a fire. And so this is my six-year-old at the time, the first time I'd plugged it in, just tripping out on the fact that her hand wasn't catching on fire. <laughs> I'm just like, what is this? So um, they're made by Dimplex. Um, a Firewater makes the ones that are fancy, but Dimplex makes the ones that most people would purchase. You can just get them online. But um, you know, they come with the fake logs and stone that goes around it and such. These are the insert boxes that you'd get. And you just fill them up with water every few days, like a liter of water. You can run it all day long uh, for about three days on a liter of water. Here is your dryer option. Next presenter is Tom Cabot, and he's going to go into this, like, how do you avoid rewiring? But this is my slide. I just want to show you on the left hand side. This is a heat pump. This is the most efficient. In the middle, this is a large standard electric resistance dryer. And here on the right hand side, this is what most people in the world use, which is a condensing washer dryer. One box does washing and drying. And all three of these can plug into any outlet in your house. So that if you have a gas dryer now, you could get a heat pump for efficiency, or you can get an electric resistance one. It's really big if you got like bedding and such. And these are examples of how you don't have to like install a new wire to your house. Um, you, you can just plug it in. How are we doing on time, Dennis? Can you give me a time check? Oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. But you're still muted. I can't hear you. Sorry, 11.23. So we, uh, okay. let's say okay. 10 minutes. Yes, we're doing it. Okay, these are just some example homes. These are 26 candy colored cottages in Fort Bragg. They are for low-income seniors, and they've got what's called a ductless mini split. There's a heat pump outside, which is a reversible air conditioner. And inside, there's these little wall-mounted fan coil boxes, and they make heat, and they make cold. So this is a common strategy all over the world. It's very easy to install. And then they have a heat pump water heater. These are tribal homes, 12 elder households up in Hoopa. <clears throat> it's the first tribal housing the state had funded. It is in 2015. Their state has been funding affordable housing for almost 60 years. And they've been funding tribal housing, California residents who pay taxes for seven years. to Get a sense of, of fairness. So this here is a heat pump that's bigger. It sits outside. It's just like the one previous. These are reversible air conditioners. This looks like your air conditioner. And instead of inside having a wall mounted fan coil, this has a fan coil that's for duct work you know, those slinkies of, of metal up in your attic or below. So I'm just saying this is a different example. And then this is a heat pump water heater by A.O. Smith. This is pretty much all of them look like this. This is 14 tiny houses for homeless veterans built in Santa Rosa. Sonoma County funded this along with um, uh, Section 8 housing vouchers. And so here, these tiny houses, each one of these 275 square foot houses is heated by just one high-end wall-mounted, or like through wall, I should say, heater, air conditioner, heat pump. So this is a heat pump here. You've probably seen them in the hotels before. This is a better one than average. It's quieter. And then this is a high-end water heater. They're designed in Japan for people who are living out in rural areas to turn off propane gas and then fill up. The Japanese bathing style is you have a 100 to 150 gallon tub that you fill up with hot water and everyone takes a shower over the course of the evening before getting into the sitting tub. So this is designed for crazy amounts of hot water compared to Americans. We design our tanks to be able to support like 30 to 50 gallons of hot water demand in an hour, mostly. You know, like a few showers, maybe a bathtub. 
they're designing it for like seven showers plus 150 gallon bathtub. We bathe in like 30 to 40 gallons in the United States. So we're using this water heater, which is good for your house. If you have one of those big eggshell bathtubs, some really big bathtub, you want a Sanco too. But we're able to heat the shower water for all seven of these homes, like the sinks and such and shower. Um, Cause these are small homes with one shower and one occupant. And this thing is so big, it can supply seven houses worth. <laughs> So it's kind of one of those edgy projects, like it's for you if you have a big bathtub, it's for you if you have a bunch of tiny houses, or we use them in apartments also. If you have a radiant floor, you have two strategies to heat your radiant floor that aren't gas. One is a ground source heat pump up here. This is the more expensive land intensive option. People still like them. They're very popular up in the mountains, central Canada. We in California should use an air source heat pump not ground source. The air around here is plenty warm. Like it's not so warm in the wintertime in Northern Canada. It's, it's plenty warm in California in the wintertime. So these heat pumps are for hydronic floors, like, you know, radiant floors, the Arctic, the Space Pack, Air Mac, Chiltrex. Space Pack and Chiltrex are very popular in California. These are radiators that you'd put in if you want radiator heating, and keep in mind radiators only do heating. This one here, this is for floors, right? All these things work for floors. These, the heat pumps I just showed you before, those also work for radiators, but these only heat water to like 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So these radiators are low temperature radiators. Radiators usually are at 150 to 180. So these are radiators that work at 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 130, perfect for your average heat pump. So if you like radiators, this is, Yaga, J-A-G-A, -A, Yaga, makes radiators just for heat pumps, very European. If you have a swimming pool, this is my rich friend, uh, CJ and Carol, they're in their 80s and they put a greenhouse over their swimming pool and they got rid of this solar thermal array and they invite us out every Sunday, my family, all my kids have learned how to swim in this tropical greenhouse with pineapples and bananas and the rest of it. In the water, which heats the greenhouse, is heated by these, um, one of these, it's specifically like the AquaCal. This is a heat pump for swimming pools. Incredibly efficient for $5,000. It heats the swimming pool all winter long. Whereas this is a $30,000 solar thermal system that would only heat the swimming pool about eight to 10 months of the year. And the other half that had a gas heater for it. So this is way cheaper, way more efficient, super reliable, heat your swimming pool in the winter and the summer. So I'm at the end, and what I want to let you know is that redwoodenergy.net backslash research has our publications that almost everything I've shown you is a screen grab or something that you can learn from these booklets, and they're, they're written so that people can read them. Like I wanted them to be like People Magazine or Us Magazine, the stuff you read at the dentist's office. It's like kind of accessible, very picture-friendly stories and such. And then the back part is for your contractors and you can point out this product, this strategy. So um, if you go to the website, it also has our most recent guide, which is transportation. So tractors, backhoes, yachts, snowmobiles, all the cars, all the electric bicycles that are, would you know, carry your packages and things, cargo bikes. So you can go there, you can go to the, the redwoodenergy.net and, and there's, user-friendly guides that are free downloads for people. There are um, Menlo Spark, a wonderful nonprofit down in Menlo Park, they funded them, Diane Bailey and Tom Cabot, who's about to present. And so thank you to them for those guides because um, they paid for all the work and such. And they also edited them and helped out. So that's the end of my presentation on electrifying your house to try to like sort of walk you through the stuff that you would use and give you some case examples and direct you towards the books because that's, yeah, I, I talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, if there's any questions, I got a moment or two here. Uh, well, thanks, Sean. Um, uh, there was a question about uh, the uh, elect, actually, that about the electric yachts and everything. Uh, there's certainly not whether uh, I, I did find some, uh, I did answer the immediate question on. Uh, What's the question? If they existed and are they on the internet and you know that kind of stuff. I, so uh, they're out there. They're not cheap, but 
uh, they're they're certainly uh, uh, demonstrating things. Also, electric ferries are starting to become a thing as well. In that transportation guide, electric ferries, electric speedboats, electric submarines, electric everything having to do with water. Some of these electric boats, they come with solar panels and they pop up out of your trunk. And so you can like have an inflatable electric boat for lakes and such, it looks awesome. So yeah, this thing is real. Uh, this, is a, um, this company is more than 10 years old. And so when I say like, you know, rich people get the cool stuff first, no big surprise, right? This is one of those examples of, I mean, they had fully electric houses with solar panels that were going across the ocean 10 years ago when most people were still working on gas in their heads. Uh, we don't have anyone who availed themselves of the Q&A questions. No worries. Uh, 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 so I do, as you mentioned, though, the guides, and I did try to put up uh, the latest guides uh, especially the um, single family construction and the and uh, the pocket guide to uh, the retrofits, yeah. uh, along with the latest uh, thing on uh, uh, EVs and transportation. Um, so that's all up on, at the Redwood Energy booth in the lot in the uh, expo and uh, for download. And uh, so uh, when you get a chance, folks, uh, really go there. These guides are. They're definitely worth uh, looking into. They're nice PDFs, and I, I, I get it now that you mentioned you wanted the People Magazine kind of dentist office thing. Yeah, um, yeah. something it, that people are willing to pick up if they're a little bit bored. You know, like maybe it's not their first choice. We're like, oh, well, I'll check out this thing. Yeah, no, they're very easy to read, and they give you an idea of, well, certainly the possibilities. You know, I mean. I don't know if anyone here is going to go out tomorrow and get a, an electric yacht, 120 foot electric yacht. If but you, can I please get on board? Can you like have yeah. <laughs> parties that you invite me out on just because I told you about it? I don't know. You can you can go to the Greek islands by yourself, and I can. Well, get you might need to talk to your friends that have the pool and the greenhouse, and yeah, no, that that helps me feel rich is getting to go take my kids to someone else's swimming pool. <laughs> All right. Well, Sean, thanks for getting uh, for starting us off.